Risk of Rain 2 is one of the best co-op shooters ever made. You go fast. You unlock a harem of helmet wearers. You inject yourself with mysterious fluids with absolutely no downsides. You can play this game for hundreds of hours and playthroughs without it getting old, and that's not even mentioning the mods. It's a game I love dearly, and I want to tell you why. Hopu Games, my beloved struck a perfect balance with Risk of Rain 2. It's accessible and easy to jump into, but it has a skill ceiling high enough to satisfy even the most touch-starved V user. Scavenge through each level to survive and become more powerful. Play with your friends and share the items you find. Play with your enemies you call friends. Watch them die and listen to them bitch in spectator mode while you take your sweet time completing the level. No risk, huh? No, he's gonna die here. <laughs> I don't believe. I'm praying on your downfall. <laughs> When first starting the game, you'll see a cutscene about a spaceship and a planet, and basically, uh, we didn't genocide the wildlife of the planet hard enough the first time in Risk of Rain 1, so we're gonna do it again. The lore of this game is actually really cool, but you don't have to understand it at all to enjoy playing the game. But it is there to explore for those who are interested, which is a very good game design choice. You land on a foreign world full of fascinating wildlife to observe. It's a lot like Pokemon Snap in that way. You walk around, observe nature, throw balls at monsters, shoot at them, kill them, them, steal their money, and gamble it away. Okay, it's actually not like Pokemon Snap at all, aside from the pages and pages of Rule 34. Anyway. The goal of the game is to survive against the hordes of this planet. Earn money by killing them. Loot chests with that money to get items. Play Fashion Scape by slapping the items all over you. And most importantly, find the teleporter, your way out of there to the next area. The chests and teleporter on the map are randomly spawned, so you'll explore like it's new each time you play, even if it's the same environment. Reach the teleporter without dying to mobs and activate it to start a boss fight. If you win, you'll get a free item and progress to the next stage. If you lose, you'll feel the hot, prickly shame of dying on the first level to a Chernobyl jellyfish. Make it far enough and you'll be able to challenge the most toxic gamer of all, Mythrix. Reported so many times that he was banned to the moon and shit talks you while fighting him. Only by beating him can you truly risk your reign twice. Beating the game is just the start though, once you realize how much there is to unlock. Each different item and character you discover changes the game so much that you'll be beating it over and over, or dying over and over, while having a totally new experience each time. The mechanic that really makes Risk of Rain special is its timer. The timer doesn't count down, it tracks infinitely upward in proportion to the game's difficulty. Every few minutes, the monsters get stronger. So on the top right of the screen, you have a constant reminder that the longer you dick around, the harder the game will get. Eventually, they start sending you monsters made of fire and ice and antlers. A few minutes later, now you got bosses spawning as regular mobs. A few more minutes, giant space crab, why not? It makes every game an arms race. You and the planet's wildlife struggling to get an edge over each other every minute. It forces you to make choices and sacrifices. You could grab every item on stage, but is it worth the time it takes to grind all the money for it and the time spent looking for everything? You could go straight for the boss in the next level, but will you be prepared without that many items? How many times can you buy all the items before your friend can get any of them? And he calls you a gamer work. The timer sets the hectic pace of this game, and it makes it a lot of fun. Before you start an arms race with the planet, though, you need to choose the character that will hold the arms. And the slugs and other fashion statements. This game excels in making its characters feel unique and all interesting to play. Primary and secondary fire, utility, and special are the four abilities that all the characters have. And some have extra passives or other quirks too. I love what Hope it did with all of them, and I want to tell you about each one. You begin with two characters, Commando and Huntress. They both have solid, well-rounded abilities. Commando's defining feature is his attack speed, meaning any item you take that has a chance to apply an effect on hit, like bleed, is great with him. More bullets, more chances to proc that effect. Huntress's specialty is shooting while running. And, uh, making me act up. Both are solid choices. As you play, you'll unlock more. And that's where the character design gets wackier. Bandit! He can turn invisible and always crits from behind. His big iron special refreshes all of his abilities when he gets a kill with it. So your strategy is that of the college party boy. Hit it from the back and then ghost that shit. Over and over. Multi! He encouraged his parents to divorce, so that they'd split up and he'd get double the toys at each parent's house. He has two guns, two equipment slots, and can switch between them at will. He can also turn into a go-kart. Engineer! His primary fire launches a basket of soft Chuck E. Cheese basketballs at an opponent. The damage from his secondary isn't much better. He has no dodge or mobility, instead having a deployable, invincible shield. So invincible that if somebody wants to slap your shit, they can just walk right through it. What the fuck is this guy's problem? 
Well, Engineer is designed and balanced around his powerful special ability. He can place up to two stationary turrets on the map at a time. These turrets copy all of his items. All damage, all healing, anything that doesn't involve stuff they can't do, like jump. The best item for Engineer is the Bustling Fungus, commonly referred to as Bungus. It constantly heals you and anyone near you, but only if you stand still. For most characters, this shit is useless because you don't have time to stand still. For Engineer, it gives each of his turrets free AoE healing for no downside because they were already stationary anyway. And the more Bungus you get, the bigger the heal and the radius gets. Place your turrets where they can heal each other, start the teleporter, and then go do the dishes or some shit because you got 90 seconds where you don't even need to bother looking at the screen. Artificier? Artificier! Artificier! <laughs> she draws mana from her wide hips, and channels the strength for spells based on her current calorie intake. She has huge, chunky damage, but no mobility whatsoever. Floating everywhere instead of walking and losing some weight will do that to you. Though, if you hold the jump button, her jetpack will slow her descent a little bit when falling. Combine this with her alternative special, you'll have to unlock it, but it makes her fly straight up into the air. Hover down slowly, use it again, and she'll never touch the ground, turning her into Fat Girl Magic Air Support. Mercenary! While you were out touching grass, I studied the blade. While you were out touching women, I studied the blade. And now that you have a loving family with kids and a house and a mortgage and a career, you come to me to help you beat Mithrix. A melee character based on the sheltered fourth grader's perception of what a Japanese person is. A challenging and fun character to play. His late game involves smashing your face against the keyboard as fast as you can endure it. Rex! You know, Rex is actually the most spiritual character. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, we'll elaborate on that. No, I won't. Um, <laughs> n no one, no one uh, sees it. Loader! Burst damage Dami Mami, who deals incredible violence at incredible velocity. Her defining abilities are her grappling hook and a charging fist attack. The charging attack pierces through enemies, but most importantly, it deals damage based on your speed. Pretend you're a Gemini driving a 1990 Honda Civic, and that the boss is a pedestrian getting in your way, and then slam on the gas. Acrid. A very good poisonous boy who did nothing wrong. All I'll say is that those toddlers had it fucking coming for aggravating him by trying to walk around and breathe like that. Captain! Grandpa is wise. He has experience. Fought Nam with this shotgun. Rose to the rank of Captain Geriatric. His experience comes with perks, too. Orbital strikes, utility beacons, and terrible arthritis. Use the healing beacon to heal your friends with the magic of taxpayer-funded Medicare. Use your hacking beacons to steal items from chests for free before your friends can buy them. Then die with your free items anyway because you have no mobility and bad knees. Heretic! She can't be picked from the character screen normally, she's a secret character. Exodia, the Forbidden One, can only be assembled by way of the four lunar limbs. Each of these lunar items replaces one of your character's normal abilities permanently. Have all four, and you transform into the secret space chicken herself. Once formed, she can kill everything in sight for you, almost as fast as she kills herself. Railgunner! <laughs> How did he go? Void Fiend! Hopu designed Void Fiend based on a guy they stalked in rural Iowa named Kevin. He wears a snapback. He has two personalities, nicest fiend you ever met, and twisted fucking psychopath. His unique mechanic is corruption. Corruption builds constantly, much like how Kevin has the constant rising urge to punch drywall. Corruption also builds when you take damage or when you deal critical hits. In his normal form, he has a very useful long-range attack. It's hit scan, so you can hit it across the map with no problem. And a built-in heal that injects monster energy straight into his bloodstream. It keeps him calm. Go without a monster injection for too long and he'll enter Code Red Do form. Code Red form gives him tons of damage, but a shorter range. His long range attack turns into a short range constant laser beam, and his heal is replaced with punching himself in the stomach, keeping him in a frenzied state longer, emulating the real life behavior of Kevin going berserk outside the local gas station when they were out of his favorite vape juice. Void Fiend is new with the DLC, as is Railgunner, and I think Hopu did a really good job with both of them. They're both really fun to play. All of the cast is. They all feel differentiated, they each give a different game experience, and each one benefits from different items. 
There are items in the game that are good on everybody, like the lens maker's glasses. Picking up these glasses gives you extra critical hit chance and makes you look very fashionable. Then there are items like the crowbar, situational or good on specific characters. It basically makes you deal more damage on your first hit. Really good on burst characters like Loader. Not as great on characters who do lots of small little hits like Commando. Then there are items that are good for nobody, like Bison Steak and Squid Polyp. The red legendary items are where Hopu decided to put all of their strongest, but all of their fucking wackiest ideas. You've got stuff like the Brilliant Behemoth and Dio's Best Friend. Behemoth makes all your attacks explode. Solid damage item. Dio's Best Friend? Extra life. Simple, effective insurance. Then you have shit like Head Sit V2, which is a pair of ankle bracelets that concentrates all your chakra in your butthole and slams you down violently in a reverse birthing ninja jutsu. Boss items and equipment items are strong, across the board, nothing much to say there, honestly. They're just good to pick up, always use them. Lunar items, on the other hand, were designed by Hopu when they were thinking, hmm, how can we make items that only people who are mentally ill will pick up? Which is exactly why it appeals to me. A lot of lunar items have downsides that are so bad that make them borderline unjustifiable to pick up in any circumstance. For example, the Stone Flux Pauldron doubles your health, but halves your speed. Transcendence turns all your health into shields. The shields regenerate, but only if you don't get hit for a few seconds. This is great if you want to regenerate all your health at once all the time, but say goodbye to your fucking health regeneration if you're taking small bits of damage every couple seconds. Shaped Glass is the most straightforward one of all, though. Double your damage, half your health. Just, uh, don't get hit, haha. <laughs> Void items are the purple ones, and they're new with the DLC. They cost health instead of money, and they're very powerful, but they are also corrupting. They're based on pre-existing items. For example, a base item in the game is the Tri-Tip Dagger. It causes bleed on hit. If you pick up the corrupted version of that item, called Needle Tick, all of the daggers that you have, or will have, in the entire game will be turned into Needle Tick. Needle Tick, instead of causing bleed, causes collapse. Another void item, probably my favorite, is the Weeping Fungus, or Wungus. The corrupted version of Bungus, it only heals you while you're sprinting, which is really good for basically everybody except for that one guy. Never had one, but somebody told me this is a really good way to start your diet. Items are stackable too, so you can have a lot of the same item for huge effect. Get jacked with lots of items, survive for long enough, and Risk of Rain essentially becomes a bullet hell game. Risk of Rain 2 is well worth the price. I went into detail on the stuff I find the most fun to talk about, but there's even more that I didn't cover, like the expansive environments, the secrets, and the easter eggs, and the lore. I highly recommend this game. Go buy it, go buy the DLC too, and play it with some friends. And if you made it this far in the video, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Show